Hey, it's the Andy Social Podcast, episode 208, and this week's guest is with NBL basketball legend Mark Davis. Now, if you're not familiar with Mark, you soon will be, but uh, he's originally from the US, moved out to Australia in the early 80s, and since then has forged this amazing career in the NBL. Um, he's a three-time NBL champion, uh, NBL MVP, grand final MVP, eight-time All-Star um, appearances. He's a Hall of Famer and a whole bunch of different uh, accolades that he's won over the years. In fact, um, I'm pretty sure on multiple occasions he's been a rebounding champion, hence his nickname being Chairman of the Boards. Now, um, growing up as a kid, and a lot of you guys know I'm a massive basketball fan, uh, growing up in Queensland and going to Brisbane Bullet Games, I remember seeing people like Mark Davis come through town, and he's a really imposing figure. And uh, so when he would come through town with the Adelaide 36s, I'd see him face off with uh, with the Brisbane Bullets and the likes of Leroy Loggins, who, um, shameless plug, has been on this podcast before. So he can go back and listen to episode 96 with Leaping Leroy. Um, however, um, I was really intimidated by these larger-than-life characters such as Mark, and meeting him in person was just incredibly cool. Because he's one of the most down-to-earth people I've ever met, super kind, super generous with his time, and you'll, you'll hear in this chat, he's just a really, really nice guy. And I'm absolutely stoked that I got a chance to meet him and have a conversation and it be on the podcast. So there you go. Um, these days, Mark has got his own basketball camp. So that's Mark Davis Basketball Camp. You can check that out by going to markdaviscamps.com.au. Um, so he runs some regular uh, basketball camps for uh, young kids in Adelaide um, each year. So you can go on the website and check all those details out and you get some of his friends from the uh, from his MBL days to come out and help him with some of those camps as well. So if you've got kids, especially in the Adelaide area, South Australia area, uh, look into that because um, he's doing some amazing things. He's doing a lot of other community work, a lot of mentoring, and just really giving back to the community who, um, as he mentions in this chat, has just completely embraced him uh, coming from the other side of the world to a very different country um, and a very different town, um, especially Adelaide. Imagine Adelaide in the early 80s. Like, oh, geez, I mean, it's, it's a pretty quiet place these days, but back in the 80s, it would have been really, really quiet. And this is a guy who, you know, was born and born and raised in Philadelphia. So massive, massive change. So um, he's giving back. He's doing lots of great things, but go to markdaviscamps.com.au. I'll put everything in the show notes over at uh, andydowling.net, and you should be able to click through on your podcast player as well. But that's enough crapping on for me. I met up with Mark at a cafe in Glenelg in Adelaide a couple of months ago. Really great chat. There's a bit of background noise. TY is going to uh, work his wizardry to bring down some of the background noise there. Bear with us. It's a really great chat, and I hope you get a lot out of it. Please enjoy this awesome chat with the MBL legend himself, Mark Davis. One thing for me is um, I'd love to I'd love to get more of the sort of 80s and 90s NBL players yep. on the podcast because yep. even when I was looking online to see all the sort of historical footage and everything, there's not much on online. It's really yep. hard to find. Yeah. And but when we were growing up in the 90s and watching us and going to the games, there was just so much out there and it was so publicised. It was going. It was so popular, but nothing was sort of captured. Or I'm, I'm sure there's archives somewhere. Yeah. But I thought I've got to at least get some of you guys on the podcast and sort of highlight it so people can go, hey, like you've, go and check out you know these great players. Yeah. Hey, listen, you know. Oh, Andy, we had so much fun back then, man, and, and, and the league was vibrant, had a quite a few teams in it, yep. uh, and um, yeah, it was just so much competitiveness, yeah. but also too, with a lot of friendships yeah. around the country in the yeah. league, uh, amongst the Australians and the Americans and all the rest of it, and it was absolutely an awesome time for basketball here in Australia. Well, as, as you said, you're, you're still keep in contact with a lot of these guys. Yes, um, yes. Can you just name drop a few just for my basketball-friendly uh, fans that are listening in? So, two of my favorites have always been um, uh, Big Willie Simmons, yeah. and um, so it's always good seeing the Big Diesel come down yeah. here and play, <laughs> and we have a good time. Um, yeah. Also, two uh, guys like Butch Hayes, so yeah. Butch Hayes played in LA, but he, he played the Newcastle, Newcastle yeah, yeah. and um, and so they're, they're two of my favorites but I say guys contact the guys like Ricky Grace and I'm always interested to know exactly how all the old boys is doing man yeah. and, and um, we you know Daryl Pierce yeah uh, all yeah. of those ice men yeah, yeah so we get a chance to all catch up matter of fact a lot of the 36 of players uh, have a reunion we have a oh, reunion really? okay, so well. we just had a reunion just recently and we got the old game back together again 
so which was absolutely fantastic. Man. Wow, that, yeah. that uh, bring back a lot of memories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. guys like Bill Jones. Yeah, I don't wow. know if you remember. yeah. So it was, it's just so awesome, man. You know, the funny thing about catching up with some of the old guys, yep. so many stories. It's not quite how we remembered it when we played it, but <laughs> they get better and better and all the rest of it's it. It's sort of so. like catching the fish. Like oh, every time yeah. you talk about the fish, it keeps getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> yeah, exactly right, man. But it's all good. So I guess without sort of doing this, this is your life timeline of events, I think one thing, like I came here this morning, I've never been, is it, do they pronounce it Glenelg? Yeah, Glenelg. Glen yeah. yeah. So I've never been here before. I've come to Adelaide many times over the years, but I've never come out here. So I'm walking around going, this is such a nice place. It's, it's awesome. so nice. Here. Absolutely awesome in Glenelg. But this would be like polar opposites to where you grew up in the States. So yes. Philly? Yes, Philadelphia, yeah. which is like the concrete jungle. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, you know, um, it's totally different. Uh, we didn't live near the water or anything of that sort of nature. I mean, I think you have to go as far as Atlantic City yeah, right, well. or something like yeah. that to get to the ocean. Yeah. So, uh, but um, yeah, but my time in Philadelphia and all the rest of it, um, you know, I love Philly. Grew up in it. Um, I learned a lot. Um, and Philadelphia, you know, as far as um, I love music. Yeah. So being in Philadelphia, we were spoiled with some fantastic yeah, sure. artists as yeah. well. And, um, you know, um, I miss a lot of that and all the rest of just the culture of it. Yeah. And um, so, but I get back home to Philadelphia every year. Okay, cool. So yeah. I leave Australia and all the rest of it, go back home for a big family reunion. Yeah. So it's absolutely awesome, man. But yeah, I'm Philly boy, man, all the way. Will Smith, boys, the men, let's go and get it done. <laughs> Meek Mill. <laughs> That's cool. I mean, yeah. I just sort of, I mean, I've, I've never been to Philly, but I've been to parts of the States yep. and um, and certain pockets of America's like, you, you compare it to places like this, it's like, it's just so different. It's yeah. so different. I mean, when, so I only just realized when I was doing a bit of, uh, bit of stalking online yeah. that you, you played in New Zealand first before coming here. Yes. Did, was that something that somebody just mentioned to you when you were in Philly and they said, hey, here's an opportunity to, to go on the other end of the planet to go and play basketball? How, how did that work? Well, it's funny how the, the New Zealand, um, I always, always thought about Australia, I mean, because I've always wanted to come here. Yeah. And so when I was over in New Zealand, I knew I was very, very close to Australia. I had a contract to go play, you know, and a lot of um, international players play all year round. So we kind of go from one country to the next country and continue playing all year. And so what happened was that I had a contract in New Zealand in a place called Hamilton. I had a fantastic time down there. A friend of mine actually uh, got a coaching job from New Zealand the coach here in Adelaide. Okay. So a lot of people think I came here to play for the LA 36ers no, and I didn't. Yeah. Uh, it actually just fell in, everything fell into place that way. So what happened was that I came to, um, uh, my friend got the job here in Adelaide, uh, coaching South Adelaide basketball club, yeah, yeah. one of the local clubs. And what happened is that they had an import that they wasn't too happy with. Mm -hmm. So uh, what he knew I wanted to come out here so what he said to me, he said, hey, listen, I got a spot because I think I'm going to release the import. If you're interested, uh, come on out. And uh, he said, it'd be like a working holiday. And I was like, wow, man. I said, you know I wanted to get out to Australia. And, you know, because I heard some cool things about Australia, man. And I couldn't believe I was this close and wouldn't get a chance to come out here. It would have been so disappointing for me. So he really made it all happen for me. And so he came out here to coach South Adelaide. He brought me along. It's like a working holiday, supposed to have been for a couple of months. I've been out here 30 years. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, uh, well, actually, as you said before, like you'd heard all these great things and that was something that you'd like to do. I mean, what, what kind of things were, were people telling you about Australia that sort of made you think, oh, I'd like to go there? Was there anything sort of in the back of your mind of what you thought Australia might be? You know, everybody used to tell me who came here, like I had uh, some American friends who came out here and just people who came out here for a holiday. And they all used to say, that's like I say, it's so chill, man. Everybody is so chilled and laid back, man. And I guess coming from Philly, man, where everything is like a rat race, man. Yeah, yeah you know, that was very, very appealing to me. And I said, man, you know what? I'm going to go out here because I'm a kind of chill guy. So I just want to, I said, I want to go out here, man, and just flow with the Australian lifestyle, man, and see how I go, man. And I fell in love with this spot when the first day I got here, man. So I guess, um, 
I guess it wasn't so much a culture shock for you because it was sort of it was exactly what you needed. Yeah, yeah, exactly what I needed, and um, you know the people was fantastic. Man. You know, it's like you know I felt uh, an immediate connection when I first came here. And uh, I like to say, hey man, you know what? I wish my contract wasn't so short. I would like to stay here. And then, you know, as I got the ball in for South Adelaide, yeah. uh, the Sixers had a look at me. Yeah. And one thing kind of led to another, man. Everything fell into place, man, which was absolutely awesome, dude. Did yeah. you, I mean, when you so were doing what we thought was two months here, yeah. initially, what were, you gonna, what were gonna be the plans after that? What did you sort of think your future was gonna be? Well, I thought I might go back because I was going, I was playing, I was going back to Mexico. Before I went to New Zealand, I went to Mexico. And so I was going to go back to Mexico from New Zealand. Okay. And just just coincidentally and all the rest of them, my boy got the gig out here. And I came and then next thing you know, I went back to Mexico after my first year being here in Australia after with, being with the Sixers. And then I came out here full time. Yeah, well. Yeah. Did you, um, over the years, did you bring any of your family out here? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, I come, I'm, I'm, I come from a very large family, Andy, and um, uh, it's like 14 of us. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so most of my family members have been out here yeah, for a holiday or vacation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, they come out here and spend, you know, at the end of the day, they got cold winters down there, man. So oh, yeah. they, need any, they don't need an excuse to get away from that cold weather, man. <laughs> Was it, was it hard for you initially, because it's such a massive family, yeah. to be so far, I mean, you're on literally the other side of the world. Yes. Was that, was that t tough for you, or were you already sort of a bit used to it because you'd been traveling already? Yeah, well, you know, the thing is, I was following my dream, man, yeah. and I wanted, uh, basketball was a great vehicle for me, not only for me to play in the game that I love to play, but also to, to uh, different parts of the world live and do their thing, man, and I was always open for that. And um, just basketball created an opportunity for me to be able to achieve all of those things. And uh, so my family, you know, they was looking at like, oh, well, my brother's overseas. We want to go and see what Australia likes. So while we all go over there and see him, and we all check out the same thing, man. Yeah, so it was cool. Um, I think when I sort of look back at old footage, especially in sort of the early 80s and Australian basketball, it was, I mean, it's so different to what it is now. Mm. Um, but I think, and you, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think around sort of the late 80s, because I think you guys won your first championship sort of, yep. what, 86? 86. 86. Yes. Um, and so around that time, sort of going into the late 80s, early 90s, I think that's when the NBL really sort of got some steam. Yeah. seemed to get a lot more popularity. Did you notice that personally for yourself? Did you notice that there was a lot more attention on, even yourself personally, but the game? Because obviously you were winning, you're winning championships, you're getting trophies, you're getting all these accolades along the way. Did, could you feel it? Well, I felt that it was, a, it was a shift in the competition and all the rest of it. And I was looking at the quality of players, the, the promotion around the game here. And I thought and all the rest of it, everything was coming together very, very nicely here uh, for the NBL. And um, it was so, I was very, very excited and happy just to be part of that ground floor thing as it was actually uh, coming up, but there was a lot of pioneers before I come out here that has opened the doors up for a lot of people and people like myself. And I appreciate all the stuff that they was able to do to help get this thing going to the way it is even today. Yeah, I, I think I think as a as a fan watching it and watching it on TV and going to games and we were, we were talking before we recorded about me growing up and going to Boondle Entertainment Center mm. for the Bullets and, and I'm pretty sure I saw you on the court at, at one of those games so it's like weird to be sitting here in a cafe having a chat to you now, it's, it's, it's pretty surreal, it's awesome. Um, but just the hype that was around then, it was so fun for like a fan of basketball to watch it all happen and these personalities and, and I look back at some, some video footage and it's just all this cheesiness, this cheesy sort of characters and personalities and all these, I mean your, your nickname like Chairman of the Boards, yes. so good, yep. and then all these other personalities and all these different teams, all sort of clashing it out and battling it out and it was just like it just made it so fun and exciting mm. and, and obviously that's that was always there but I think around that time it got hyped up a lot more mm. and especially when television was sort of filming these games and, and getting a lot more exposure I mean that would have been so cool to be a part of 
is absolutely awesome. I mean, also too, <clears throat> as you know, and all the rest of it. I mean, coming from Brisbane, yeah. yourself, um, I guess you would have enjoyed that first championship that we was hoping that we won back in '85, <laughs> and Brisbane said, "No, you're not." <laughs> With good old Leroy Loggins and the old Cal Brutons and all the rest That's of right, it. Yeah, yeah. So, I think it's a bit of a rivalry. rivalry yeah, there, that yeah, rivalry yeah. was unbelievable, <laughs> man. And, but. Um, Away from that, um, you know, guys was very, very competitive. Yeah. But off the court, man, the respect and the friendship and the relationship that guys have was absolutely unbelievable, man. Yeah. And I think every a lot of things was done in the true spirit of the game of sport. Oh, it, I mean, I think when I compare the NBL to the NBA, which is like two completely different things, and the NBA is just this gigantic beast of a, of a, a league, it's massive, but I think maybe it's just Australian culture as well. I think the NBA, as I said before, like the laid back sort of attitude that you can see at the NBL, and even now with the NBL, it's probably more popular than it's ever been. Yes. It's still got that vibe where it's like just totally laid back and chilled. Whereas the NBA is like this massive corporate giant, and yeah. it's this big, big money making thing, and uh, it's, just, it's just a completely different vibe here. So yeah. that, I, I can totally see how that sort of fits in with, with the perception of it. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and, and you know, the thing is, the one thing that's the Australian way from a cultural point of view, you know, they go out there and they love their sport here, man. They play hard, yeah. but you know the old saying, man, they're quite happy to have a brew afterwards, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, the thing is, being out here, you're like, this is so cool, man. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I mean, it's, yeah, I think, I think, I don't think we take ourselves too seriously. Yeah. And so I think we're, we're quick to sort of uh, poke fun at each other and, and have a joke and have, have fun. So it doesn't matter how serious it is on the court and, and that can get quite tense and heated. Um, as you said, like afterwards, completely different story. Oh, yeah. You know, and uh, that's what I appreciate more about anything because I think Australia really got it right. It's no different than being in the wor uh, workforce out here. They understand the importance of that balance between work life yeah. and um, just a decent life for yourself as well and finding that balance in there instead of it being one way or the other way. And I think I think America can learn a lot in those ways of trying to find that good balance there because I think that's very healthy, not only for, I think it's healthy for the mind and soul, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And how you go about your, and also to your mental capacity too as well, man. Yeah, because you, I mean, you do a lot of that. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. And obviously, um, well one thing, I'll get, I'll get onto that, but um, one thing that maybe ties into it is that you came out here and I guess class is an import, mm -hmm. and that was always the terminology for, for foreign players coming in to, to play in the league. Um, since you came and you got established and found your feeding and, and never left, yep. um, you saw a lot of other people come from overseas here. Did you ever find that you were mentoring new people coming into the league that were from the States who were trying to work out, oh, what's this Australia all about? What's this league all about? Yeah, you know, the thing is, uh, because I remember when I first came out here, I had people that I was asking questions around and they helped me out. Yep. And, um, what, and, and I see a lot of guys, especially we get a lot of my homeboys coming from Philadelphia out here. I mean, we got guys that's right now here from Philadelphia. And, um, you know, they, they ask sometimes, yeah, how, how you have managed to be out here this time, what you had to do and all the rest of it, what was it like and all. And um, I think the thing is, that's the way I think they want to even be headed uh, long term. Like, you know, Australia is a very easy place, man, to, um, to make home, right? To make home, you know what I mean? Great place, man. And I, I hope Australia truly appreciate, man, what they got going on here. They got something very, very unique and special, man. I, I don't think we do until we leave and yeah. we travel. And yeah. then we go, oh, actually, I can't wait to get home because home's yeah. pretty good. You know? That's right. So, yeah. Hey, you know a funny story. I do remember I had a crazy incident when I first came out here to Australia. Um, I didn't know a lot about Australian lingo. Okay, yeah. And uh, so, I'm... I'm it was the weirdest thing in the world after we did all the formal stuff uh, with the, um, uh, the club and all the rest of it. Um, we had a manager, what we, I guess you guys call him like an awkward type of guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And he had so much slang, man. Like, I didn't really understand the cat, man. Like, it took me a while. I was like, I was like I'm new, but I don't want to seem like I don't know what's up, right? So what happened was that this is the craziest thing in the world happened. 
we was all laughing and joking and everything was cool. He said, bloody hell, he's a big bloke. And so I didn't know what a bloke was. Oh, I man. thought it was like a um, a derogatory oh, term or something, right? Oh, and so I said, yo, man, I said, you ain't got to call me no names, right? <laughs> and everybody turned around like, what? <laughs> like, and I know they looked at me like, man, we got a lot of work to do on this guy. <laughs> and then when I found out what a bloke was, yeah. you know, now my ego kicked in and I want to seem like I was a knucklehead, man. So I, I, I said, oh, no, man, I was just playing, man. I knew what it, I knew what it broke no, up. <laughs> so smooth. But yeah, it was a funny, I felt so embarrassed, man. So, but you know, the thing is, man, um, the kind, the kindness and the warmness, man, that sometimes people make you feel welcome out here is like unbelievable, man. Yeah. I mean, I, I only notice Australian lingo and slur, mm. like the uh, sort of, yeah, that, that sort of lingo words and things like that when I'm overseas. Mm. So I remember when I was a kid, uh, I went with my parents to LA and we went yep. to uh, a Lakers game at Forum. Okay. And uh, it was against the Mavs. And this was Kobe's first year yep. and he was off, coming off the bench. Okay. And Shaq was injured. These are all these things I keep remembering. Anyway, I was there with my dad. Yep. And so we're sitting in these pretty good seats and uh, one of the ladies comes down. And she's asking his food, and dad, dad goes, "Oh, something like, oh, thanks, love, or something like that." And she, and she, and she was African American, and she just just pulled her head back and looking at, and it's like, like basically, what'd you say? And he's like, "Oh, oh," and he's so self conscious, like, "Oh, did I say something wrong?" And, she just, and then and she she loved it. She goes, "You call me love." Yeah, and it's like, that's right. And, that's and, right. So then, and then everything he said was so strong, and I never noticed how strong it was in comparison to hearing an American yeah. accent. Yeah. And and then when I came home, you don't you don't notice it at all. Yeah. But for you coming here, I mean, you're just surrounded by it. So it would have been like, wow, like it's almost another language. Yeah, you know, but it, it was it was so refreshing, Corn. You know, at the end of the day, you know, you want to understand exactly. Hey, listen, this is the form of communication. Everybody, yeah. I said, you know, I'm with it. You know, and it's so weird, man. Um, I went back because I started telling my friends about some of the the slang words that, <laughs> yeah. that they use here yeah. in Australia, and we go back, man. And it's the funniest thing in the world trying to watch an American put an American sentence but take one Australian word and try to throw it in there like and make sense of it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so hilarious, man. So I took them back. All of them wanted to know some of the slang words. So I've taken them all back to these Australian slang yeah. dictionaries. Yeah. And so we all get together, man. That, that's who buys them. And that's amazing, man. <laughs> now I know who the market is for those books. I always see them on the, sh on the shelf in the bookstore. Yeah. I go, oh, no one's going to buy yeah. those things. It'll so be me, it, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. Um, going back to what you said before about uh, mentoring. So I guess it, when it got sort of later stages of your career, I mean, did you start to think about what your impact would be on other people? Was that something that you started to look at more after you retired or sort of later into your career when you started to think about what you could do to help other people? Yeah, you know, so when I was, um, uh, when I was stopped playing, um, I worked as a marketing executive for the LA 36s. Yeah, so, and so what I did was, um, that was great, but I wanted to kind of go out into the community. What I found out, there was a lot of people that had a perception of you yeah. from what they say on TV or from a far plan on the floor. And, um, you know, we all take on a different persona when we're competing than the person that they are. Right? And so what I wanted to do, I wanted to go out into the general public and introduce myself to the general public. And so I wanted to find out things that was important to the community. And it was my way of just saying thank you for all their support because the Australian general public have been absolutely fantastic to me throughout my career. So I wanted to go out and introduce myself as Mark Davis, the person, not the basketball. I guess the whole thing is that what I was trying to just, I guess what I'm getting to is that I don't want to be defined by a basketball game. I want to be defined as the person that you know. Excellent. Right? And so 
when I seen that people had a different perception of me than what I was, because they used to say, oh man, he's got, you know, don't, the more I said, I'm really not that guy. I was gonna say, you're pretty just, aggressive uh, on the court. Yeah. Like, even, even like yeah. when you were sending me emails back and forth, I was like, oh, you seem like a really sort of upbeat kind of guy. <laughs> and I was, I was waiting to go, oh, maybe you're a bit reserved and sort of, I'm just thinking about this persona I had of you on the court. So there yeah. you go, yeah. And, 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 and so the whole thing is that I really wanted to, um, to go out and introduce myself and get people to say, wow. And the, people have said to me when they got to meet me, they say, I watched you for years. I totally thought you was a different person. And I thought I said, well, the guy who's coming over to talk to you right now is the person, not the basketball. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I feel better that way because I want people to understand that basketball is what, what I do. It's not who I am. You know what I mean? And um, so we started out. Um, I started working with uh, uh, kids who have been a little disadvantaged um, and I started uh, run, uh, doing a mentoring program around that and it was able I was able to get out and touch like the community as a whole right and and try to help kids reach their goals and dreams from my life experience what I was able to achieve because I needed people along the way to help me achieve the things up so I was trying to understand what was important to them and where they dreamed and try to give them some tools of how the best way to get there. And that's how we started out with the mentoring, man, and um, um, been doing it ever since. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that must, that must be such a, so, such a cliche thing to say, but it must be so fulfilling for yourself to be able to, because not only have you had that impact as a player, and that, that was an identity that you've, you've had for years, and, and as you said, like some people just know you for that, mm. but now to sort of go, well, I've used that, and now I'm showing who I am as a person, and yeah. be able to have an impact on just lots of different people. Yeah. That must be, I can't even begin to imagine what that's like. Well, it's, you know what, it's quite rewarding. It's rewarding for me when I see a young person go through their journey and, and the things that they have to go through and endure in life, and then be able to come out the other side man, and be able to move forward to make them as productive as they possibly can and live a healthy life for themselves. Man. So do you do you do that via um, like different organizations? Yes, yeah, so and we so deal you link with, a, in with them. Yes, yeah, yeah. so we link in with a, a lot of different organizations and. Um, and they provide us with some of the, their clients uh, yeah. who um, they felt that may need a little bit of assistance and help in this area. Oh, yeah, so, I'm fascinated by that stuff because yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's, I think it doesn't get talked about enough, I think. Yeah. And I think even people that probably aren't so much disadvantaged but sometimes are missing a particular figure in their life as yeah. well. Um, sometimes you just want a bit of guidance from somebody and it might even just be a quick chat and yeah. you get to meet someone for, for a couple of hours or it might be that you hang out a lot longer and, and sort of get some guidance. So yeah. It's, yeah. I think it's a really important thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm a true believer. Every young person needs to change. And, and a lot of it is that uh, everything is about self-esteem yeah. and how a person perceives themselves. Yeah right to move forward in life and sometimes only thing they need is somebody to believe in them yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what i mean and walk through this journey with them yeah, yeah. knowing that they have somebody to buy alongside of them it's very very simple in, in concept it yes. can be hard yeah but yeah. um but it is really simple yeah and so yeah. yeah so people don't have to overcomplicate it it's just a it's, it's a support thing isn't it yeah very much so man so you've so. got so you're doing that and um and it's been for a while and you've also been doing the basketball camps as well yes so um how long has that been going for? Uh, we've been doing um, the Mark Davis basketball camp. This is our 13th year now. Yeah, well. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and we run it down at Emmanuel College uh, here in Adelaide. And we get a couple hundred, um, a few hundred kids, two to three hundred kids every year. And um, kids come from all over. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and not only our camp is there to design and help them with their skill sets from a basketball point yeah. of view, but it's also there to teach them the life skills that's associated with team sport such as how to handle adversity, decision making, respect for the game, all the things that they can apply in their everyday life. So we don't want uh, them just to look at it as just basketball, besides being able to make um, healthy life skills 
and develop healthy life skills for themselves that they can use in their everyday life. Yeah, there's, no, there's no point being a great basketball player but a bad bad person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. You gotta, I agree, man. You've got to build agree. them up completely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's cool. Um, and I think you mentioned Willie and, and Butch. Yeah, Willie and Butch do that. Yeah. Matter of fact, they do the same thing in their communities as well, man. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah it, seems to be, it seems to be a common theme with, with a lot of sort of retired basketball players because it's, it's such a skill that you want to pass on to other people. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, I guess I guess especially coming from urban America, yeah. we needed a lot of help too, man. People along the way, people are mentors from our family to friends to teachers to coaches. All of those people played an important factor in our lives, man, to help us be able to make good decisions in our lives, not just on the court, but off the court too as well, you know. And um, at the end of the day, you know, um, the way we look at it is that the reality is, even though basketball was the tool, with, with the, what they came in for to understand and learn, we train them up to follow their dreams and get them to the highest level as possible. But the reality is only 1% go on to make a living out of it. So I don't want our kids to be cheated out of the other 99% that make them a good person. It. Yeah, it's, it's either it's not a case of you either get lucky on that 1% or it's a failure. Yeah. It's, and it's not a failure. You're exactly right. So, so we want them to walk away with something yeah, that cool. they can use in their other, everyday life to make a living for themselves. Did you have any of that when you were a kid growing up? Did you have any sort of, uh, did you like go to a basketball camps or did you have any sort of mentors that sort of helped guide uh, you? Yes, I went to a few basketball camps and a lot of coaches. Yeah. Um, my high school coach played a very, very important. I went to an urban school, had a Jewish a Jewish man as a coach. Yeah, well. Yeah. And uh, he was absolutely fantastic, man. He was like my second dad. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, he helped me learn so much about, about life. You know, and I never forgot that. And my mom uh, uh, was a great supporter of me as a as a, a basketball and developing as a young person. But I realized that some of the work that I do, I asked myself a long time ago. I said, "Why did I choose this?" Because there was a lot of other things I could have done. And uh, bless her soul, my mom passed away years ago while we've been out in Australia. But um, my mom was a family therapist. Okay, and yeah. she used to take me to sometimes to work with her and I used to meet some of her clients yeah. and I think I had um, I think I had a soft spot or understanding of trying to help because I met people who needed some help and my mom was helping and I think part of the stuff that I'm doing I think my mom influenced me in a, a way that I didn't even know until I got older. Until later on. Yeah, yeah until later on I realized. To see, yeah. Well, I guess you get to see the, the direct impact of being able to help somebody yes. get, feel better, get better. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to see how how those links sort of match up, yep. but not understanding it until much later on down the track. And you sort of look back in over your shoulder and go, oh, wow, like, oh, that makes sense. Now yeah. I understand what, what's happened. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. the, it's funny how how you start to connect the dots like that, man. Yeah. yeah so it's all cool, though. Yeah. 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 yeah it's insane. Um, I've got to ask, because I think... Um, did you, did you try to go through the NBA draft? Yes, so I went in as a free agent yep. for the Washington Bullets. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so I went in as a free agent, uh, stuck around for a little while, but uh, yeah, just... You're doing pretty cutthroat. Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty cutthroat, but also to uh, probably, I probably could have gave myself a better chance if I was, if I had a little better preparation from a mental point of view of what I was, I was getting myself into. Uh, so, um, but I learned from that. I learned from, it was a great experience. I learned from it. Um, I flew, I went, lived in Washington for a little while, um, getting ready for the, um, they got a tournament down there with the NBA teams and the Washington Bullets was in called um, Urban Coalition. And um, yeah, that was a great experience for me. And then I realized after um, getting my first gig to play overseas was in Mexico which was not overseas when you look about the United States, that's across the border. But that was my first gig, yeah. played over in Mexico, had a fantastic time over there, and we won a national championship over there in Mexico. Nice start. Yeah. yeah. So would you believe in all the rest of it, 
Mexico and Australia was my connection with Mexico and Australia. The first year we lost in Australia to the Brisbane Bullet. Yes. We lost to Mexico City in the championship that first year. The next year I went back. When I came back to when I came back to Australia in '86, we won the national championship here. Then I went over to Mexico, did the same thing, won the national championship. It was a carbon copy, man, of the same thing for the first two years, man. Yeah. Just, just watching those patterns sort of unfold yeah, in front of you. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that's yeah. Right. So, I played in a place called Chihuahua. <laughs> yeah, Chihuahua. <laughs> I'm just imagining this place. It's just lots of little dogs running around the place. Well, yeah. <laughs> you would think so. But yeah, you know, it was um, it was a cool city. Had a great time down there. There, they um, actually it's like a farm team. Looked like um, because um, it was the Lakers colors. Everything okay. was Lakers, man. Yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, we played in front of like 18,000 people every wow. night, man. Yeah. Wow. Pretty awesome, man. Would, would that have been, because Mexico is obviously a completely different country. Yeah. Together. Did you find that that was challenging for you? Because as you said, like you really fell in love with Adelaide and Australian culture and that laid back sort yeah. of attitude. I guess parts of Mexico have got a laid back attitude, but it's probably at the same time, it's very different. Like, oh, yeah. Pretty, pretty fast paced. Yeah. Sort of lifestyle. No and they love their sport. Mexico love their sport. I mean, obviously, soccer yeah. is like yeah. a religion over yeah. there, man. They love their soccer, man. Um, uh, but basketball, they love basketball too. And a, a lot of the stadiums that we played in was absolutely massive. Yeah. And we played, they had a national basketball league where we played around the whole country. And um, yeah, it was quite interesting. I remember I didn't, you know, coming from, um, uh, I guess, urban, they had a lot of Spanish yeah. speaking people in my community yeah. when I was growing up. So it's funny when you think you understand a little Spanish mm. until you actually go to the country. Yeah. And he's like, man, this sounds totally different, man. <laughs> like, seriously. And, um, you know, you start to pick up words. So I had to learn on the job wow. when I was actually in Mexico. But, you know, I learned how to ask for certain things that I needed. And, yeah. Enough to get by. Enough to get by, man. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, yeah. So it was all good. Have you gone back to Mexico since that second time you went back? Uh, not since the second time and all the rest of it. Um, yeah. Mexico is, a, is and it's a changed place a little bit now, yeah. a little bit yeah. than when... Um, when I was there, yeah. um, you know, but um, I haven't had a chance to get back. But I guess I, I would say Mexico, I guess, would be equivalent to your Australian Bali or something. Yeah, yeah. Especially when it come down to a holiday, you know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah, you can get a lot of stuff over here with the peso, man. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely, man. Yeah. That's cool. Well, um, look, I'm going to make sure that I don't take up too much of your time, but um, I think one thing that's super cool and I sort of said this can't remember whether we actually got it recorded or not but um, a big thing for me is like I grew up sort of in that sort of heyday NBL sort of era around late 80s early 90s and um, going to Boondle and watching the boards and then seeing you guys come in um, and for me like I, this podcast is so much fun because I get to talk to heaps of different people yeah. but it's also to, a bit of a throwback where I start to look back in my past and go what did I actually love when growing up and, and all these different people and, and the NBL is such a massive thing for me yeah so to you were you're one of these people, you're one of these larger than life characters that you know, I had no idea what you'd be like. No, so this is super okay. cool now. I have a disappointment you. <laughs> <laughs> and um and, and it's just um it's amazing to, to be able to sort of connect and, and have, have a great chat with, with someone like yourself and um, uh, I think uh, I'll definitely be uh, taking advantage of some of your generosity and seeing if I can get a few more a few more uh, a few more friends on the podcast. You know what? The I'm, and I'm sure they'll love the the come I mean uh, the NBL right now, current NBL, the model that they have, I think is absolutely fantastic. The promotion around the game, the players that they have here, I think is, is really taking the game where it needs to go to. Um, I do believe that the NBL can do a better job in utilizing a lot of the, the, the guys who used to be in the league before, a lot of the historian guys, you know, uh, because I think you know, like most clubs, it's really about the history and about bringing history into the future. Yeah, you know what I mean? And having your future understand what the history is like. Yeah. 
And, you know, I love to see guys like Leroy Loggins up in Brisbane being utilized. I love to see the Cal Brutons around the league. The Big John Dorges. Um, oh, all of those. Yet. Yeah, Big John. And, you know, all of those guys um, being used. Butch Hayes, Willie Simmons, Ricky Grace, and Perth. I just like to see those guys and all the rest of them working closely with their club, trying to bring value to taking it even to another level. Because there were a lot of people who come to basketball back then. They still come to basketball today, and I think it will be a nice little fit for them to be able to relate to people also, too, that they grew up with actually watching. Oh, definitely. I think it just makes yeah. it more exciting, and it's all about... It's all about story ones. Yeah, you know, it's all yeah. about yeah, it's just a, it's all like uh, the personas that people would have on the court. Yeah, you know, they were they were characters in yeah. a way. You know, yeah. and so people identified with that, and so you, you you found your favorite player because you could identify with their aggression or maybe their yeah. their calculated sort of strategic, like a point guard or something like that, and, and their personality on the court or the or the the matchups between two different players from different different teams going head to head and. Uh, and they're all stories. They're all stories, yeah. and you go, "Oh, that's cool. I wonder what's going to happen next week, or you know, the next season, or whatever it is." And so, a lot of us, and I'm probably sort of the younger sort of end of that era. There's so many of us out there who were just obsessed with it and just loved it. And yeah. so, you know, I'll also go to NBL games now. It's great, but that yeah, that connection's not quite there. It's yeah. sort of like it's almost like a separate league now. Yeah, to what it used to be. Yeah, exactly right. So man. they need to. They just need to join it a little bit more I, and I agree. integrate it. Yeah. I agree 100. percent I mean, I watch some of the guys. I, I go to games and and I'm amazed at some of the things that you know uh, some of the players that's out here right now. They got a lot a lot of NBA talent out yeah. here now. Yeah, that's massive. And I have so many guys that I enjoy truly watching in the NBL now. Like you know, I'm big fans of this. You know what I mean? So. Um, I just would love to see that relationship become even a little bit tighter with the old school in the new school. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'll, I'll do my little part to just keep right bringing these end. stories back and make sure that people can reconnect and reminisce and and uh, and hopefully reach out to you. And of course, Mark, um, you've got your website. So is it yes. is it Mark Davis? Mark Davis Camps. Camp. Camp. Yes, yes. Awesome. Well, I'll yep. check a link in so yep. people can Beautiful. check it out and Fantastic. reach out to you and say hello. Fantastic. Thanks Look for having me. To Andy, my pleasure, man. Thank you and so we're much. Shaking man. hands right now. Good. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks, man. Bye bye. All right. If you want to reach out to Mark, you can go to markdaviscamps.com.au. Um, I don't know if he's got any social media handles, but if I find them between now and uh, when the episode is published, I'll dump them in the show notes. So just go over to andydowling.net or click through on your podcast player. Um, a lot of these guys don't have a lot of social media presence, so I've really got to give some of these guys a bit of a nudge. But um, if I find stuff, I'll dump it in there. So we'll see how we go. But uh, massive thanks to Mark for being a part of this podcast. And yes, I need more NBL players on this podcast. I've got to get some freshies on here as well, some current players as well as um, some of these great throwback uh, people from uh, when I was going to NBL games uh, back in the day. It was fantastic. So uh, more NBL players. I've got to get some NBA guys on as well. Um, that's that's one of my 2020 goals for this year. We'll see how we go. Um, but uh, that's about it from now. Uh, AndyDowling.net if you want to learn more about me, our band Lord, um, my other podcasts that I've been involved with. Social media handles are all there. Um, you can shout me a beer via the PayPal button, which is paypal.me slash AndyDowlingOfficial. And um, that's pretty much about it. Um, please reach out reach out I should uh, if I'm going to speak English please reach out to Mark and any guest that's been on the podcast if you enjoyed that particular episode and just let them know what you thought a little bit of uh, love from the Andy social team will go a long way and just helps uh, bring more and more people toward this little podcast of mine so until next week folks go back and listen to the previous episodes Andrew Farris from NXS James Norbert Advani uh, Joel Hoekstra from uh, White Snake, Daniel Towns a comedian we've hit the ground running in 2020 we're in the 200s now crazy talk episodes nestled gently in between and until next week folks ta-ta Larry